Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salam Rasulullah. You're watching Huda TV, and we're dealing with a topic called Lifting the Fog. And this is to remove the misconceptions, misunderstandings, misinterpretations about Islam and the Muslims. I'm your host, Yusuf Estes, and in this segment, I'd like to deal with the subject of worship. What is worship in Islam? According to Islam, it's only Allah, the God, the one almighty, creator and sustainer of the universe, who deserves worship. According to Islam, it is Allah who has created everything. He's created the human beings and he creates for them what he wills. Especially when it comes to the subject of worship, all of this is for him and for him exclusively. How could we know what the correct worship is? Well, first and foremost is to establish in our minds that there really is a God and that He's one. He has no partners. In some of our other segments, we've dealt intensively with this issue. But for this program, we'll just suffice to say that we can look around us and observe that everything has an order to it, the way it's created. Therefore, there must be a creator. Even the scientists have dealt with this issue and come to the conclusion, many of them today, saying that there is something which they label intelligent design. If there's intelligent design, then obviously there's some creator behind it. Suffice to say that we as Muslims agree immediately with that concept, and we also believe that that same creator has devised for us a way to know him. And to know him is through those who he sends as messengers, and they all come with one single message. For us, as Muslims, we understand that God began the creation of the human being with one single human being. And he tells us in the Quran, Ya ayyuhan nasa taqa rabbukum alladhi khalaqakum min nafsin wahidin, wa khalaq minha zawjaha, wa batha rijalin kathirin wa nisa'a. And the meaning of this is, Allah is telling us, O oh, you mankind, have taqwa for your Lord, which is uh, to say piousness or be God-fearing, because he's the one who created all of you from a single soul, which we call Adam, and from him created his mate, and from these two he created many men and women. Now, this sets the tone not only for the Muslims, but also for the Jews and for the Christians those who believe in the monotheism or the oneness of God and believe that he created all of us starting with one person could easily use our common sense to realize that if there was only one person to start with, obviously he could have only had one religion. He could have had only one belief and he could have had only one way to worship because there wouldn't be any church for him to switch to. There wouldn't be any other faith to change to. There would only be one. And obviously, whatever Adam was on, as far as belief is concerned, must still be the right one today. And each of the prophets after that called to this same monotheism or oneness to believe in God as one and to follow the worship of this one God according to the way that Adam would have understood it. And this is the teaching of Abraham and Moses and David and Suleiman, and Jesus. Peace and blessings be upon them all. Now, how can we know what the worship is? We will agree that there could have only been one correct way to worship at the time of Adam. <laughs> so, what would that be, and how would we know it? Would we be able to identify this today, when we have billions of human beings walking around the earth today? How do we know? Because each one will tell you, well, my religion is the right way. And another will say, well, no, 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 no. My religion is the right way. Others may tell you, well, that all the religions are the right way. But which, if any of these statements, is true? According to the Muslim understanding, there is no religion that's correct, that's man-made. Because the Muslim says, La ilaha illallah. The meaning of this is that there is none to worship. There isn't any to worship at all except for Allah. This means that it would have to be a way to worship based on how 
Allah wants it to be done. It would be up to him then to define religion for us. In other segments, we've talked about this word deen. Deen, as we have discovered, means the way. The way that you live your life. So the human being is responsible from the time they're born, really, until the time they die, to do their best with whatever they may know to follow this way. But how will they know what the way is? Well, that becomes the obligation or responsibility of Almighty God. It needs to be for Him to show us the way to worship Him. Okay? The Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, taught us that all of the babies are born already in that proper state of mind or condition. In the Arabic language, it's called the fitra, the fitra of al-Islam, the natural inclination, the natural condition to already be worshiping God alone without any partners, to be in submission to Him, surrender to Him, and obedience to Him. You might say, well, how could a baby be like this? And in fact, the baby is already the way that Allah wants it to be. It's not until the child grows up and becomes older that he becomes accountable for his deeds and his actions. Those deeds, those actions, the things that he does will only be held against him if he consciously begins to do what he knows is wrong. So according to Islam, a child is not born in an original sin and he is not being punished for the sins of his forefathers. In fact, it is in Islam to know that God, Almighty Allah, never punishes anybody for what others do. And he doesn't put a burden on anybody greater than they can bear. Understanding that, then we can understand the beautiful statement when even in English we say that somebody is innocent as a newborn baby. So this is exactly the status or state of mind that it should be for the human being to be in the right way with the law. The right religion or deen or way of life is to be in the state of the newborn baby. The pure, innocent, and simple status that a baby would have. It's also interesting to note that if a child dies, that the belief in Islam is the child goes to paradise, to go to heaven because the child hasn't committed these sins, hasn't done the things which would cause it to be punished in the next life. It is only after the child grows up, and this is, by the way, we're talking about all different nationalities, all nations and all people, because it doesn't really matter if the child is born to a family who claims to be Hindu, Buddhist, Christian, Jew, this doesn't matter to Allah because what the parents claim to be or what somebody puts on a passport or on a birth certificate is not what Allah is looking at. Allah looks to the heart and the heart of a child is pure and innocent. Therefore, the way of a child is the right way. This helps us to better understand why we would translate the word deen in Arabic to be the word way in English. But it's a more comprehensive term than just the word way. It means a complete holistic way of life. In other words, from the time a person is born until the time that they die, from the time that they wake up in the morning until the time they go to bed at night, they would always be in this way. Whatever their way is would be their deen. And this fits real well with what Allah teaches us in the Qur'an. I'd like to refer to a verse that we use a lot when we explain Islam to people, especially when we talk about Islam being the right way for all humans, for all times. This verse says, In Adina, in the Lahil, Islam. For sure, the way with Allah is Islam. But it needs now for us to refer to the word Islam to better understand what that means. Because if a person understood Islam to be something that's coming only with Muhammad, وسلم, peace be upon him, then they would misunderstand the whole context, the way that it's being presented. 
Islam is not like any other religion because first and foremost it is not really a noun as much as it is a verb. It's an action. It's what you do. Let's break it down from the Arabic language and take a look at it. It comes from a root, salama. And from this, we find many words. Taslim, istislam, islam, salam. And these words indicate something that a person has to do. It's a giving up, if you will, or a submission, a surrender to Almighty God and a complete compliance or obedience to His will, to His rules, His commandments. Also, it is sincerity. It's the action of sincerely doing something for the sake of God. And, most important of all, to do it in peace. To know that what you're doing is what God wants you to do and you're doing your best to achieve that. So, now putting these two words together, Deen and Islam, and then understanding it in English as the way of life in the surrender and submission to the commandments of God in peace, then it becomes an understanding more so than just a term. This understanding is that the human being is like the rest of the creation. All of it is made by God Almighty. And all of it is always in submission to God. For instance, the sun is a creation of God. And the sun always does what God wants it to do. In the same way, the moon is a creation of God. It also is doing what God wants it to do. The earth, the stars, the mountains, the trees, everything is doing what God wants it to do. So we would say that it's all in submission to God. All of it, all of the creation is what? It's in Islam. It is doing Islam, the action of Islam. And by the way, in Arabic, whenever you have one who is performing the verb, the action, you put mu in front of it. Mu, Islam. One who does Islam, Muslim. So this is how we understand that the sun is a Muslim, the moon is a Muslim, the earth is Muslim, and everything on the earth and in the earth and around the earth is Muslim because it's already submitting to God. The only one that's not automatically a Muslim is the one with the free choice. So the free choice is given to the human beings to decide if they want to do what God wants them to do or not. So it's up to us if we would like to be in submission to God or to be a Muslim. We're going to come back after this. You're watching Huda TV. We're talking about lifting the fog of the misconceptions in Islam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala choose whom he wills subhanahu wa ta'ala for his mercy, for his messengership, for the revelation to be revealed. This is not for the human beings to make that decision. If a person would turn to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sincerely, truthfully, asking for forgiveness, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised to forgive. We have as Muslims a duty and that is to recite the book of Allah, to ponder over the verses, the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to act according to the Qur'an. The mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encompasses everything, but it who would this mercy will be for. And the Prophet sallallahu was sent to all mankind. So the ummah or the people of the Prophet sallallahu are all mankind since the time of the Prophet sallallahu till the day of judgment. Why waste our life without getting to know every verse in the Qur'an, what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim 
You're watching Lifting the Fog, Removing the Misconceptions about Islam. We've been talking on the subject of Deen and Islam and explaining that these two words together carry a very big concept. To understand it in English requires a phrase more so than just a couple of words. When we say Deen al-Islam, we're talking about the total way of life of a human being to be in submission, surrender, and sincerity to God's commandments while they're in peace. We also mentioned that the one who does this is called a Mu-Islam, a Muslim. We talked about the fact that the sun, the moon, the planets, the stars, and all of the earth and everything in it is already in submission to God's will. So therefore, everything is considered as a Muslim. We also mentioned that the human being makes a choice to be in God's will. So those who don't do that would be called other than Muslim. What would that be in Arabic? When a person is a disbeliever in English, it means they don't have belief. But in Arabic, it carries a different meaning. It's stronger and it's very clear what they're doing. It comes from a word in Arabic that's related to farming. It might be strange to you to think of this. But when a farmer digs the ground and plants the seeds, then he takes the dirt and covers over those seeds. The action of this is called kafara, to cover up. And one who does it is doing kufr, and he is called a kafir, because he has covered something. Well, in Islam, we understand that if a person covers the truth, and there could only be one truth, the ultimate truth that there really is a creator and the correct way is to be in submission to him. This is logic. Whoever covers this up is committing something called kufr or they are kafir. And we translate it to English as disbelief. But in fact, I think it's better to understand it in the Arabic. By the way, I might mention that it's very important for the Muslims to begin to learn more about the Arabic language. Many of you may not know this, but over 80% of the Muslims today know little, if anything, about the Arabic language. The Arabic is very specific for the deen of Islam, the way of Islam. It's very specific to give us these deep and rich meanings. This is why in our program, Lifting the Fog, we're going through the words, breaking them down, and then giving this kind of understanding. The next word I want to come to is called ibadah. What is ibadah? We talk about worship. Every single religion has some kind of worship in it, whether they worship God or they worship other than God, or some even worship the devil. <laughs> and that makes you kind of wonder who, who would want to worship the loser if everybody knows he's ultimately going to be the loser. <laughs> That's another subject. But if we look at this word ibadah, exactly what does it mean? When Allah tells us in the Quran, He uses this word in many forms. Budu, meaning to worship. And one who does it is, he, uh, we're going to say in Arabic, Abdullah. And he is having his worship only for Allah. And when we use the word ibadah or worship, we understand it has to be exclusive for Allah. So, how do we know what the correct worship would be? Now, each religion out there, there are many religions. We acknowledge that immediately. But we also say that none of them are going to be right except the one which is coming from Almighty God. Now we can better understand the phrase that we talked about in the first segment of the program when we said that Allah says in the Quran, in the dina in the lahil islam, for sure the only correct way of life will be a person submitting and surrendering their free choice to God. Now this indicates right away that we have a free choice. Now how did we get a free choice? It has to be that God gave it to us. And He's letting us choose for ourselves if we want to go this way, that way, or some other way. Some people will tell you, well there are many ways, and all of them go to God. I heard one person tell me one time that God is like at the center of a wheel and the wheel has many spokes that go into the middle of it. He said it doesn't matter which one you choose, all of them would be correct. But let us think about what we talked about in our first segment and see, does that really work? Does that make sense? 
And in fact, it doesn't. Because there's only one God, there's only one way, and it doesn't make sense that you could use any path and still wind up in the same place. Because we start from a focal point, and we're not all going the same way, unless we're going to this uh, way of life as a Muslim. Let me give you another example about this and think about it. Every single religion out there has got a form of worship, as we mentioned. But have you ever noticed that they also have in them a worship of something that is created rather than the creator himself? Think about that for a minute. What is it that the Hindus worship, for instance? What is it that the Buddhists worship? What is it the Christians worship? What do the Jews worship? If their worship is exclusive only for God and has nothing to do with the creation in any form, then quite possibly this is talking about the worship in Islam. But if there is an object of worship, something that you can hear, such as sound, or see, or smell, or taste, or feel, or even imagine with your mind, then this worship would be considered in Islam as false worship. False worship, or making a partner with God in worship. So then we have a different word here. We're going to call the one who commits this action, which is called shirk, or making partners with. When a, a partnership, like in a business, has shirk, these people are together, or mushrik. A mushrik is committing shirk. You hear the mu in front of it again? Mushrik. So if a person is committing shirk, making a partner with God, this is something Allah tells us in the Quran real clear that he doesn't tolerate it. He says he does not forgive shirk, but anything less than this that he can forgive. Does this coincide with the teachings that we find in the Bible? What remains of the Bible in the English translation does say exactly that as a matter of fact. In the first commandment, which we find in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, the first commandment mentioned in the book of Deuteronomy, if you look to this first commandment, it says, I am the Lord your God that brought you out of the land of Egypt and the house of bondage. You know no other God beside me, and beside me there is no other God. Then he goes on to say, Thou shalt not have any other gods beside me. Now this means he doesn't want you to set up partners in worship with him. That's pretty clear. Do we find this same teaching in the New Testament? Well, if it's really a continuation of the same beliefs of Adam and Abraham and Moses, quite logically it has to continue that. Do we find such a statement attributed to Jesus? Well, as a matter of fact, we do. We find two statements, at least, that we can refer to immediately to confirm this. First of all, we'll look in the book of Mark considered by most of the biblical scholars to be one of the oldest manuscripts in the Aramaic language. This teaching we find in chapter 12, verses 28-29, right in there, when they're asking Jesus about the great commandment. And he's telling them, it is to know, O Israel, that the Lord your God is one Lord. And you have to love or worship him with all your heart, all your mind, and all your strength. Well, that's pretty clear too. But is there something from Jesus allowing, peace be upon him, allowing us to negate, cancel, or turn our back against the teachings or the commandments we find in the Old Testament? Well, not according to the book of Matthew. If we look in the book of Matthew, in chapter 5, verse 17 and 18, here is a statement attributed to Jesus, peace be upon him, clearly stating that you must uphold these commandments, all of them. In the English translation, more or less, it says, Think not that I came to destroy the law and the prophets. I came not to destroy, but rather to fulfill. And not until all things are accomplished, Shall a single dot or a jot or iota be in any wise lessened? 
And whoever breaks the least commandment and teaches this, he will be the least in the kingdom. But whoever keeps the commandments and teaches this, he'll be the greatest in the kingdom. Not unless your righteousness exceeds that of the Pharisees. By the way, who are the Pharisees? The Pharisees were the leaders or the scribes, the teachers at that time who were in control of the temple. And he's saying about the Pharisees, unless your righteousness exceeds theirs, you'll never enter into the paradise. You'll never go to Jannah. So we see clear teaching here from Jesus. If you want to accept any of the teachings from the New Testament, referring back to the commandments in the Torah. Because when you use the word law, if you look to the word that was used in Aramaic, you'll find that it refers to the Torah or the law of Moses. So this law is not being canceled. It's not being canceled by Jesus, nor is it being canceled by Muhammad, peace be upon them both. Because Muhammad, peace be upon him, is coming with the same message in essence and insisting about the belief in the one God and obeying his commandments. Now, over time, if people have lost those commandments or misunderstood them, mistranslated them, then again, it's necessary to do what? Exactly what we're doing with this program, which is to lift the fog, get rid of some of the misconceptions. So now we can understand why there's a difference between even the monotheistic faiths, because even within them, you will find different groups or segments that come out of it claiming different beliefs or different understandings. And which of them would be right? The only one that's going to be right is the one that Allah, God Almighty, has mandated and commanded from the beginning. Because it's up to Him to show us what He wants us to do. Verily, the religion with Allah is Islam. Now, we're going to give it again, though, with a broader understanding. This is, by the way, uh, this is in chapter 3, verse 19 of the Quran. Okay? Broader understanding? Indeed, the only way of life acceptable to God is that you submit to Him on His terms. And this, at least now, begins to lift the fog in relationship to misunderstandings about worship in Islam. We'll be back with more of this. Stay tuned. Oh.